Hello, fellow adventurers, and welcome back to another episode of Word Safari. I hope you enjoyed the three-part series that I just concluded with my friend and colleague, Dr. Jackson Crawford, on the origins and development of the alphabet. This is going to be the first in a four-part series that is going to kind of go off of that series that we just concluded. In this series, rather than looking at the general origins of the alphabet, we're going to look at the origins of each individual letter as we trace them from their distant Semitic and Phoenician past through the Greek, Etruscan, and Latin languages on into modern English today. As I said, this is going to be a four-part series because we have a lot to talk about. Uh, we're going to start in this episode by talking about some vowels, most of the vowels actually, and some associated letters. In part two, we are going to look at five letters that all descend from the same Phoenician letter, wow. Uh, in part three, we are going to look at stop sounds. And then in part four, we are going to look at sibilant and sonorant sounds. So that's how we're going to split the letters up during this four part series. Uh, before we get started, you should know about some basic linguistic notations if you don't already know about these. Uh, a letter with an ang that is inside angular brackets it's like this uh, is basically trying to tell you that that letter inside the brackets is the letter, the actual written shape or grapheme that we are talking about when we write that. So if you see a letter inside of those brackets, I mean something like the letter A, as you can see on your screen. On the other hand, a letter inside square brackets like this is not specifically the written version of the letter. It's actually the sound of the letter and not just the sound of the letter in any alphabet or in any language, but specifically in the international phonetic alphabet alphabet, or as we often call it, IPA. Uh, you can look up IPA symbols online. They're used all the time on places like Wikipedia, so if you're not familiar with IPA, it's actually pretty cool to learn. You don't need to learn IPA to watch these videos because I will pronounce all the sounds that we are talking about in these videos, um, but if you do know IPA, it certainly won't hurt. The first letter that we are going to talk about in this series is very appropriately the letter A. Of course, as you know, the letter A is the first letter of our alphabet, just as it has been the first letter of almost every alphabet that has descended from the ancient Semitic alphabetic tradition. Uh, as I talk about, in the discussion with Dr. Jackson Crawford in our three-part video on the history of the alphabet, the shape of every letter is not random. Rather, it actually descends from a specific picture of something in the real world. Every letter also had a name in the ancient Semitic alphabetic tradition, and that name was of whatever the letter was a picture of. So the original name of the letter A was actually Aleph, and Aleph was just the regular Northwest Semitic word for ox. And so the letter A was originally a picture or a rendering of an ox head. Now, uh, as you may also recall from that series, and if not, I'll tell you now, in the original alphabet as it was designed in these ancient Semitic cultures, there were no vowel letters. There were only consonant letters. So the letter A was not yet a vowel at this time period. Rather, it represented a consonant, and that consonant was the glottal stop, which in IPA is that thing that looks like a kind of question mark without the dot underneath it or at least that's how I think of it. Uh, of course, in the modern English alphabet, just like most modern European alphabets, we do not have a letter for the glottal stop, but we actually do say glottal stop sometimes. So for instance, um, when you say the, the word or phrase, uh-oh, do you feel that catch in your throat between uh and o? Oh? That is a glottal stop. Essentially what a glottal stop is, is your glottis stopping the air and your glottis is down here in your throat. So we English speakers say glottal stops all the time even though we don't actually write them. Uh, also, sometimes we pronounce our T's like glottal stops. Uh, depending on the dialect of English you are speaking, this particular example may or may not apply to you. But for instance, when I say the name of the superhero Batman, I don't say Batman with an actual T there. That would sound a little bit weird. Uh, I say Batman. And so I actually replace the T with a glottal stop, Bat man. And if you're a speaker of American English, I bet that you do as well. Regardless, my point is that glottal stops are all over the place in the English language, even though we don't actually write them. So you can kind of understand what 
A, the letter A, originally sounded like. Uh, the original character for the letter A looked kind of like an ox head. You can kind of see the head. You can kind of see the horns coming out. Um, if you fast forward about a thousand years from the earliest alphabetic inscriptions to the more stylized Phoenician alphabet, uh, the letter comes out looking a little bit like this. And honestly, this is still kind of recognizable as an ox head. You can see the head. You can see the horns, uh, which is what is in that letter, the vertical bar. Um, we're going to see with many letters that uh, the Phoenician alphabet oftentimes has a letter that is pretty recognizable, or at least somewhat recognizable uh, from the perspective of our current alphabet, but you have to twist it, turn it 90 degrees or some other way to make it look more like what it looks like today. So you can see that their letter Aleph in, in the ancient Phoenician alphabet looks almost exactly like our letter A. You just have to turn it 90 degrees to get to our letter A. Now, one of the biggest transformations that the letter A went through in its entire history is when it was adapted by the Greeks from the Phoenician alphabet. Now, the Greeks didn't have a glottal stop, or if they did, it was kind of like in English where it wasn't a letter that they really thought of, and it wasn't one that they feel like they felt like they needed to write. Um, so what they did is they adapted this letter for a different purpose. And this is where the letter A, like I said, went through its biggest change. The letter A at this point got reassigned from glottal stop, the consonant in a, uh, O to the vowel ah. Remember, this is one of the big changes that the Greeks made in the Phoenician alphabet is they changed a number of letters from consonants into vowels, thus basically introducing the, uh, the use of vowel letters for the first time, at least in a comprehensive fashion. So the old letter that was ox and was pronounced glottal stop in the Phoenician alphabet came to be the letter alpha. And you can see that the Greeks didn't actually change the pronunciation of this much. Alep became alpa. And yes, originally in Greek, that PH would have been pronounced p and not pho. The pho actually developed much later. So you can see that alep and alpa are not actually really very different sounding words. Of course, the difference, the difference is that in ancient Greek, alpa did not mean ox and it didn't actually mean anything. All it was was the name for that particular letter. Uh, you can see that already in ancient Greek inscriptions, they have turned it 90 degrees from the Phoenician model and it looks pretty much exactly like our modern A today. So if we keep going, uh, the Greeks uh, gave that alphabet to the Etruscans. The letter A passed with little change into Etruscan, and then the Etruscans gave their alphabet to the Romans who spoke Latin, and once again, the letter A changed uh, very little when it got passed to the Romans. We're going to see that the letter A is actually one of the easiest ones to chart, so it's a good one to start with for that reason too. The alphabet then made its way from Italy to Northern Europe and passed to England, where it was adopted by speakers of Old English. And originally, speakers of Old English did not actually make many changes to this letter either. So once again, the development of the letter A stayed pretty conservative. Uh, however, Later on, at the time of the Norman invasion, and then also uh, at the time of the Great Vowel Shift around 500 years ago, the letter A started having to do more work in the English language. It came to represent the sound A, which originally had been a different letter in Old English. Um, and then at the time of the Great Vowel Shift, A shifted to A, which is the second uh, representation there in IPA. Um, and so today, the letter A is actually doing more work than it has ever had to do before. It actually had a pretty simple history from Greek into Etruscan, into Latin, and then into English. But really in the past thousand years in English, we have put it through its paces and made it do more work than ever. Let's move on to the next vowel letter in the alphabet, and that vowel letter is, of course, the letter E. Now, with the letter A, we noticed that it was from a Semitic word that meant ox, and there isn't really a lot of controversy about that. But with some of these letters, when we go back to the Semitic original, you will be able to find a number of different possibilities if you do an internet search, and the letter E is one of them. There is some controversy about what this letter may have originally been in that original Semitic alphabet. Alphabet. Now, probably the most common opinion you're going to see is the one that I'm giving you here. The letter E meant something like, hey, it has something to do with somebody with their arms raised. They may be yelling, they may be shouting, they may be celebrating. So sometimes you'll see this letter called jubilation or something like that. Uh, but regardless, that seems to be the original form of this letter in the Semitic alphabet. Now, just like with the letter A, this was not originally a vowel letter. This was a consonant letter. And the original value, the original phonetic value of this letter in the Semitic alphabet was just a huh sound. It was basically a regular H. 
But if you look at the letter, the actual drawn letter that I've given you here, you can see that this may have been some kind of jubilation or somebody shouting hey or something like that. And of course today, our modern English word hey starts with the letter H too. So that's kind of convenient. Now, by the time of Phoenician, you can see that the letter had become a little more stylized um, and it still descends from a picture of a stick man figure uh, shouting hey with their arms up in the air. But it doesn't necessarily look like that anymore in the Phoenician alphabet. Now, let's talk about another letter before we go on because these two letters are actually closely related to each other in the original Semitic and Phoenician alphabets and some of their history is a little bit intertwined. So we are going to discuss these two letters, the letter E and the letter H, together. Now, of course, one major difference in English today is that the letter E is a vowel and the letter H is a consonant, but originally they were actually both some kind of H sound in the Phoenician alphabet. As we just talked about, the letter E comes from this letter H that was just a regular H, but if that was a regular H, what was this other H? This other H was what we call a voiceless pharyngeal fricative. This will not be on the exam. You do not need to make this letter. Um, but this is an H that was a little throatier and harsher sounding. Um, it's usually written with, uh, at least not an IPA, as an H with that little dot underneath it. Uh, so for instance, in uh, transliterations of the modern Hebrew alphabet, which still has this letter, you will see it that way sometimes. But in IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, you can see that it's written as an H with a, a horizontal line through the top of the vertical bar. Now, what did this H sound like? in the uh, ancient Semitic languages for which this alphabet was designed, it sounded something like huh, a huh, or something like that. It's very throaty and it's a little harder to make than, an, than, than the regular H that we have uh, really in most of the world's alphabets and languages, including English today. So they had hey, the regular H, and they had hat or something like that, this voiceless pharyngeal fricative. Now, the original character was something that looked like a courtyard or a fence, and most people think that that was the original meaning of this letter and this word hat, but uh, we're not 100% sure. You can see that in the Phoenician version of this letter, they just turned it around a little bit, but it still kind of looks like it could be a fence or an outline of a courtyard or something like that. So what happened to these letters, E and H, when they went into Greek? Well, as it turns out, just like English, Greek had regular H, but it didn't have this ha huh sound. They didn't need they didn't need a letter for that because they didn't have the sound. So what did they do because they had too many letters for H? Well, they came up with a simple solution. They turned one of them into a vowel and kept the other one for H. Now, maybe they could have turned the regular H uh, into H and then turned the H huh H into a vowel, but they actually chose the other way around. They actually turned the regular H the letter H hey, into the vowel letter A, and that was actually the original name of this letter in Greek, A. And then they turned the throaty H into their regular letter H in Greek. Remember, that was the letter H in Phoenician, and they just turned it into Heta in Greek, and that was the original name of this letter in Greek, Heta, because it originally meant H and not another vowel. Now, if you know the Greek alphabet, you know where this is going, but let's talk about how both of these letters changed in the later Greek alphabet. Uh, the letter A is simpler. It later got renamed Epsilon. Psilon is actually just a Greek word that means simple. Um, so Epsilon actually just means simple E, uh, and it's, it's a whole phrase in the Greek language. But the original uh, name of this particular letter in Greek was just A, not Epsilon. However, what about the other one? The other one was an H sound, heta, as we just talked about, um, but not all dialects of Greek had the H sound, at least for long. We know that around the time the alphabet was being modified for Greek uh, in the 8 and 700s BC, there was a whole important dialect of Greek called Ionic that was spoken uh, mostly in the islands of the Aegean Sea um, that was losing the sound H in that particular dialect. And so Ionic Greeks suddenly didn't need the letter H anymore either after a little while. So they also had this problem. They had this letter H that had been adapted into the Greek alphabet, but they did not need this letter because they didn't have the sound H. So 
What could they do? Well, they just did the same thing that had happened with Epsilon originally. They took an H letter and they adapted it into a new vowel letter. Of course, that new vowel letter was called Eta instead of Heta because the H had gone silent in Ionic Greek. Uh, that vowel letter was uh, basically a letter that was going to represent a long E sound as it does in the Greek alphabet to this day. If you know what Eta is, it's not a consonant, it's a vowel, uh, and it originally at least represented a long E sound that has obviously evolved uh, over the past few thousand years into modern Greek. Now, what about other dialects of Greek that still have the H sound? As it turns out, the Ionic Greek alphabet came to be adopted by other Greek dialects, even the ones that had the H sound. Uh, and so when they did so, they adopted this letter that looks like H, that we call eta, and they adopted it as a long E, so suddenly it was a vowel everywhere in Greece, all right? Uh, one of these dialects was Attic, which is the dialect that was spoken in and around Athens, so that's obviously important for historical reasons. Um, so how did these dialects end up writing the H sound? Well, essentially, they used a little thing that looks like an apostrophe to write the H sound in that version of the classical Greek alphabet, which is still the one that most people learn today. Uh, so for instance, you can see at the bottom of your screen if you wanted to write the ancient Greek word ho, which was a way to say the, so it was a very common word. In Ionic, that would not have an H in it, but in Attic Greek, that would still have an H in it, and it would be pronounced ho. So how would you write that? You'd write it with an omicron, that O-looking thing, which we're about to talk about later in this episode. But then to write the H, you would write a little thing that looks like a rightward-facing apostrophe that we today call breathing marks. Um, and th that is actually not random, the shape of that apostrophe. Um, but uh, I will let somebody comment on that because I'm sure somebody knows where that comes from. Okay, so the letters E and H ultimately both ended up as vowels in Greek, but before they both ended up as vowels in Greek, the Greeks took that early version of the Greek alphabet over to Italy. Remember, this early version of the Greek alphabet is the one where E, epsilon, was a vowel, but H, heta, was not yet a vowel. That's the alphabet that made it to Italy, and the Etruscans took this over and used E as E and H as H. And that is, of course, also the version of the alphabet that passed to the Romans and into Latin and forms the basis of our alphabet in English today. Now, in Latin, that letter E could be used as like a long E like E or a short E like E, but those are both pretty similar sounds. And of course, H didn't have much of a change at all. Uh, when that Latin alphabet was passed into English, uh, initially it was passed with little change. E was still A, H was still H, huh, but then later on through the development of English, as we're going to see with pretty much all of these vowel sounds, other vowel sounds kind of got added to the uh, realm of possibilities for what that letter E could be doing. So it couldn't just be doing A or E today, but as you know, in modern English, uh, the letter E can be the E sound. I mean, we call it E. That's due to the great vowel shift that happened about 500 years ago. And it can also be the sound A. A, which is actually two sounds if you think about A, which is why we, we basically write it E-I, as you can see in the International Phonetic Alphabet, because it's actually two sounds. We don't have the pure monophthong A in English anymore. We say A, which is actually a diphthong. So English has actually really changed this vowel letter E quite a bit. But H is still H, so we haven't really changed that much at all. Let's move on to the letters I and J, which we are also going to consider together for a particular reason. Now, I and J both go back to the same Semitic letter, and that Semitic letter was called Yod. Yod was a word in the ancient Semitic languages that meant hand, but not just hand, but like the whole forearm, including your hand at the end of it. Uh, just like with all these letters, this was not a vowel letter originally. This was a consonant letter, and that consonant was the consonant that in English today we would usually write as y, uh, but in the IPA, it is written as j, as you can see there. Uh, and if you're wondering why that is, we are actually going to talk about why that is uh, as we go through the history of the letters i and j. Now, this is the original character, and you can see that originally it looked like an arm with a hand attached, and then the Phoenicians stylized it, changed it up a little bit, but you can still see that the Phoenician letter keeps that image 
pretty well of a hand attached to a forearm. So what happened when the Greeks got hold of this letter? Well, interestingly, the consonant Y, that Y sound, didn't really exist in Greek. Or if it was, it was kind of incidental, kind of like a glottal stop maybe. It wasn't something that they felt like they needed a letter for. Uh, in linguistic terminology, it wasn't really a phoneme of ancient Greek. However, there is a vowel version of the consonant y, and that is the vowel e. Now, if you think about it, e and y are very closely related sounds. So if you say e, and you sort of just stretch it out and make it a consonant, it's going to naturally become a y. So i and y are very closely related, and there are good linguistic reasons for that. So if you've ever studied phonology or taken a phonology class, you, you know the science behind this uh, and the anatomy behind this. However, uh, you don't need to know that to know that e and y are very similar. Sound. So when the Greeks took over this letter yod, they, they said, okay, this is actually pretty simple to make into a vowel. We're just going to change it from the consonant ya to its, its vowel twin, which is e, the sound e, which we would, of course, spell with this letter i today. Uh, and they didn't really change the name much. They changed it from yo to iota, uh, which maybe sometimes even in that speech they would have pronounced yoda more with a y than an i. But for them, this was more of an i letter than a y letter. Now, as far as the actual shape of the letter, uh, remember that it was kind of a little zigzaggy. And in earlier versions of the Greek alphabet, like really early versions of the Greek alphabet, there were still some zigzags in it that made it look more like the Phoenician yod. Uh, but ultimately, the Greeks ended up straightening it out to a vertical line that looks a lot more like our modern I today. Now, of course, this letter, this letter iota, got passed into Etruscan and it got passed with a little change. But then when the alphabet went from the Etruscans to the Romans, things got a little bit more complicated because in Latin, the language of the Romans, they actually had a Y sound. They had an E sound and a Y sound. So maybe they could have made up another letter for one of these and split these back up or split these up for the first time into an E letter or an I letter, I guess we would say, and a Y letter. But they actually kind of used an interesting solution. They said E and Y are very similar sounds. One's just a vowel, one's a consonant. And so we're just gonna use that letter I for both of them. And as a vowel, it could be E or I in Latin, which are both slightly different versions of that vowel I. But regardless, they kept writing it with that same straight bar that the Greeks had innovated originally. Okay, so this sets the stage for the birth of the letter J, which actually just came right out of this whole situation that we were just talking about in Latin, where the Romans had opted not to invent a new letter for the consonant Y. They just kept using that I letter for both the vowel E and the consonant Y. Now, as long as the consonant Y was pronounced like the consonant Y, this didn't seem to cause too much trouble for anybody because, again, E and Y are both very closely related sounds, and you can tell just by listening. So the Romans didn't need to be advanced linguists to figure this out. However, in the early medieval period, as the Roman Empire began to break up, there began to be sound changes. The spoken Latin language evolved some. Certain sounds began to uh, evolve in different directions and, and, and uh, come to sound differently, essentially. And one of these sounds was the consonant Y, which had existed in Latin. During the early Middle Ages, the consonant Y began to evolve a little bit of a flair to it. Uh, and instead of just being Y, it would be like J or J, uh, which are the two things in IPA right there. So when the consonant Y evolved into the consonants J or J, depending on where you were in Romance-speaking Europe, uh, they kind of uh, you know, got to be a lot different from that vowel letter E, because E and Y are not very different sounds, but E and J are very different sounds. They don't sound anything alike. However, because the Latin alphabet only had one character for both of those, People who were living in that part of Europe, the Romance-speaking part of Europe, France, Spain, Italy, uh, still had to use the letter I to write either the vowel E or the consonant J, and, or whatever it was in your part of Europe. And so this obviously got to be a problem, maybe not a problem, but a complication, because usually you want a different letter for a different sound, and these two sounds were now very different. Uh, however, uh, as it turns out, handwriting, uh, specifically medieval handwriting, came to the rescue here and provided a solution. There were different forms of letters and handwriting in the medieval period, and sometimes uh, these scribes would write the I as just a vertical bar, and sometimes they would 
put a little innocent hook on the bottom. Now, this was not originally meant to be a separate letter. This was just, you can kind of think of it as like a different font of the letter I, but not a separate letter. However, around the time of the Renaissance, people realized that they had a problem with a solution just waiting to be used. The problem, of course, was that you had two sounds, E and J, and these were very different sounds that could use two different letters. On the other hand, you had two different versions of the letter I being used in manuscripts, one without a bottom hook, and one with a bottom hook. And so they said, why don't we just start using the regular vertical line for the vowel E, and why don't we start using the thing with the hook for the vowel J that evolved out of the sound Y. And so it's only been about 500 years, but the, these, the letter I was split into I and J. I is now a vowel, J is now a consonant. But in different parts of Europe, that, uh, that J was pronounced differently. In other words, the letter J was used to refer to whatever the outcome of the sound Y was in Latin. But in different parts of Europe, that would be different. So in Spanish, ultimately, the sound Y evolved all the way to the sound H, which is why, generally speaking, in modern Spanish, the letter J is used for H because there is actually an evolution there back to the Latin consonant Y. Now, in Germanic languages, which uh, were never speaking Latin in the first place, the letter J was adopted just to, to write the sound Y uh, as the consonant version of I, which is why J is usually more of a Y sound in Germanic languages, not English, though. And it's also why J is used as the Y sound in the International Phonetic Alphabet. However, in one particular region of Europe, France, the letter J was used to write J, or later J, which is a slightly simplified form of that. So at the time of the Norman invasion, essentially what happened is this letter J and this sound for it, J, was imported. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's talk about how this letter originally got from Latin to English. So when the alphabet was first taken over from the Romans into Old English, this letter was only used for the vowel E. So actually, the speakers of Old English paired this back a little bit. The Romans had been using the letter I for both E and Y, and the speakers of Old English said, no thanks, we're just going to use it for the vowel E. And then they had the sound Y, but they used another letter or a couple of other letters to write it. And if you know Old English orthography, you know that this was a G or a G-like thing that was used to write the consonant Y. Now, Old English didn't have the sound J or J in it at all, so they didn't need a letter to write that to begin with. However, everything changed when the French invaded England in the year 1066. This is, of course, the famous Norman invasion. When the French invaded England, they brought a lot of their loan words with them, French words that had the sound J in them that had evolved from the sound Y in Latin, and they also brought their custom of writing it with the letter I instead of the letter, whatever letter Old English English might have written a sound yo with G or something like that. Um, and again, Old English didn't have the sound J to begin with, so they wouldn't have even known where to start with writing that. But French had, had developed this problem and they brought this problem with them to England. Uh, as it turns out, the solution also came from continental Europe because when the letter J was invented around the time of the Renaissance, people in England said, you know, we could really use that to write these French loan words that have a J sound in them. And so that's how it is today, of course, where we use the letter J in English to refer to the consonant sound J, and we use the letter I to refer to the vowel E and I, and of course, since the Great Vowel Shift about 500 years ago, also I, and that's why we call this the letter I today. So in a nutshell, that's how I and J split. They were originally one letter, and then in the past 500 to 1500 years, a series of events have occurred that have caused these to split into two separate letters today, one of which is a vowel and the other is a consonant. We're going to end with a discussion of the vowel O. Um. So this is going to be the last letter that we talk about in this first episode of By the Letter. Again, O is a vowel today, but in the Northwest Semitic languages, they did not write their vowels. They did not have letters for their vowels. So this must have been something else, and indeed it was. It was a consonant, and that consonant was called Ryan. And it's very difficult to pronounce. Uh, it was originally a voiced 
pharyngeal fricative. There's the IPA sound, which will not help you pronounce it at all. Um, but the name of the letter was, again, Ian, and this was a this was a regular Semitic word that meant I. It was the regular word for I, and you can see it there on your screen. Uh, the original drawing was something like an I, and then Phoenician actually simplified this to just an I with no pupil, just, uh, just something that looks a lot like our letter O today, as you can see. Um, so when the Greeks got a hold of this, of course, uh, the Greeks definitely did not have the sound g in their language uh, because most languages don't have the sound g because uh, it hurts your throat and I'm going to stop saying it now. Um, so they didn't have that sound, but of course they did have the letter O or the sound O rather. And so they just used this letter I-N um, and they uh, just reassigned it to the value O. Very simple, okay? This is one of the few letters where the Greeks did not take over the name of the original Phoenician letter and adapt it to Greek. Uh, they seemed to just throw the whole I-N thing out the window, maybe because it was so hard to pronounce that first letter. They were just uh, completely alienated from it, and they just decided to call this letter O and draw it much like an O looks like today. Now, of course, if you know Greek, you know that there's no letter O currently in Greek. So what happened to it? Um, originally, this O could refer to either a short O or a long O in Greek. In that Ionic alphabet, the same Ionic alphabet where the letter Heta became the letter Eta and came to be used for a long E, uh, those speakers decided that if they were going to have a long E letter, they also needed a long O letter because in ancient Greek, E and O were by far the two most common vowels. So they could get away without a long a, e, u letter, but they felt like they needed a long e and a long o letter uh, because those were their two most important vowels. So what they did is they took the letter o, which previously had been for either short or long o in Greek, and they chopped a little bit off at the bottom and dragged out the bottom and created a new letter. And they called this new letter omega. Omega is just Greek for big O. Then they renamed the old o that just looks like an o, little o. And in Greek, little o is o micro, micro. You can see micro in there. So we borrowed a lot of words from Greek to have micro or mega in them. But that's actually where the modern names omicron and omega come from. They actually just mean little o for a short o and big o for a long o. So what happened? Uh, when the alphabet got passed to Italy, it was before Omega had been invented. So there was just one O in the early version of the Greek alphabet that got passed from Greece to Italy. So O got passed uh, into Etruscan with little change. As it turned out, Etruscan did not le need this letter because they were a four-vowel language, A, A, E, U. They didn't have O at all, so they eventually dropped this letter, but not before passing the alphabet on to the Romans, who, of course, did have the vowel O. So they did need it. Uh, and they used it for both their long and their short O, so something like O and all. But again, pretty similar sounds, as you can see. And of course, they wrote it like an O. Uh, the changes from Latin to English were also not very large. Uh, the vowel O passed into English, still meaning O or maybe all. Um, but then later on, the vowel O came to be quite complicated indeed, because if you think about it in the English language today, that vowel, that vowel letter can really represent a lot of sounds. It's not just O or A, but sometimes U, especially in words with double O. It can represent A a lot. It can represent A uh in words like sun. And I could go on. There are actually other sounds that this letter can represent too. So once again, we in English have taken a perfectly good letter uh, that was relatively simple when we inherited it from the Romans, and we have made it very complicated indeed. We're going to stop there. Uh, stay tuned for part two, where we are going to look at the letters that descend from the Phoenician letter. Wow. See you then.